Okay. I, I'm um, I'm very much an advocate of of the um, Amazon basin and uh, very much somebody who believes that trees should not be um, um, even injured. Um, but when it comes down to the the actual origins of the Amazon basin, uh, you will see that um, the archaeology tells us that this primeval ancient um, woodscape that spreads across the Amazon basin uh, across nine to ten countries across South America is a landscape that in the main has been created by the human hand. Um, and that's going to be probably an extremely unusual statement for anyone to, for anyone to hear. But what we are finding with the Amazon basin is much of what we think is pristine um, primeval um, landscape has at one point been altered by the hand of man. The table in front of us is a table which is quite an unusual table to start off with. It's all in Portuguese, um, but the content is something where we need to begin. You can see a list of sites. Some are in Bolivia, um, most are in Brazil, across the Amazon basin. And these are archeological sites, sites that have held the sway of humanity um, at points here over, over 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, and so on. Um, these sites that have been sampled contain um, ceramic artifacts, artifacts that have been created by peoples in South America. Most of these sites that you can see listed along the side, DC means AC or CE, so most of these sites have been um, abandoned in the archaeological record um, hundreds of years before the Portuguese or Spanish have got to South America. That leads us with a bit of a dichotomy. We're always told that there were no civilizations other than the Inca and the Nazca um, in South America. But the information on the ground in the archaeology over the, past two, uh, over the past 20 years has told us that the Amazon basin was teeming with civilizations and millions and millions of people once spread across the Amazon basin um, a thousand years ago. That leaves us with another problem, the question of how ancient the Amazon um, uh, forest actually is or actually isn't. Um, and you can make up your own mind, but I've already made up mine. After delivering this six times this week, the information and the data that I've been looking at is extremely surprising. Up until 20 years ago, I will have given you the following story. And this is where we mean to begin. So um, if, you can, if you can picture, um, and this is what we're going to do. So a bit of an annotation. Um, if you can picture in green, which is a good start. Um, the big splodge, the big circle on the left-hand side of your screen if you can imagine that, is a tract of the Amazon Basin. Is that showing up nice and, nice and clearly? Yeah. Yes. So, I've told this story anecdotally a um, number of times in my lectures, uh, but this is time that I use it in its right context. So, all the, um, all the crosses, which I'm just about to, there you go, cross one, two, three, four, five a nice number so up until about 20 years ago so if we go back in time 50 years ago if an anthropologist an ethnographer and an archaeologist went to one of these crosses um, and they had a conversation with a tribal leader the conversation would be would go no such different than the conversation we're just about to have so the three of them goes into that little village that little village that we're going to mark with the number one. If I can mark that one. They all go to village number one. And the tribal leader, they sit down with the tribal leader. Typical type of thing that you'd see with um, Sir Attenborough or any other explorer to the Amazon base. And they all sit down. And the conversation might go, how long have you been here? And the tribal leader will, would say, I've been here, our people, our civilization, thousands of years. And the ethnographer would turn around and say to the anthropologist, but this building doesn't look very old. And the archaeologist would pipe up and say, 
there's no way that your civilization has been here because this building doesn't look very old. And the tribal leader would say, we've been here for thousands of years. And the anthropologist would look around and say to the ethnographer, well, most of their tools look very fresh. Um, the thatching looks almost new. Um, and the people look very well fed. And they would go away from the village. Ten years goes along. Ten years goes by. And they go to X, number one. And there's nothing there. The village has, has either been burnt down. The other cross, they found the village abandoned. The other cross, uh, they found it inundated with water. And the other two crosses and the other cross after cross after village after village, they find abandoned. So the archaeologist's immediate reaction is that the village has succumbed to disease. The ethnographer would agree. And the anthropologist would say that has to be a fact. So they just go, they, they just go over the mountain. And lo and behold, lo and behold, they find another X. And this X itself, if I do it in a different color, let's, uh, let's change the color a little bit. Let's change the X to not let me change the color. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's rub those two out a minute. Hang on, one, two, three, four. Right, okay. Let let's draw a, another shape. Okay, where the ticks are. You can't see the ticks. This is not working. Where the ticks are. Right, okay. Um, work for me, please. Um, and let's. Uh, it's not changing the color. Right, the okay. It's not letting me change the bloody color. Right, hang on, let's start again. Right. Like a red circle. Can you see the little ticks on there? Yeah, they're kind of gray. All right, then let, let's just, just try and get this right. Okay, all right, we've got to get this perfect. Perfection <laughs> is the, where we need to be. Hang on. Um, and. Oh, bugger. Right. Red circle. It's not letting me do it. I have a red circle. Hang on, we're going to start again. Hang on, we'll go that back to that now. Hang on. If you say red circle again, I'm going to scream. <laughs> All right. Oh, sod it. Can you see the ticks? Yes, they're great. Yes, we can. Okay, if you look at the ticks, right? Yes. You can see five ticks on there, right? right. Sorry it's not coming out any darker. Anyway, the, the ethnographer, the archaeologist, the anthropologist goes to the top tick. And they go into the village and lo and behold, they see the tribal chieftain that they had spoken to 10 years earlier. And they go up to the tribal chieftain. They say, we don't understand. Why are you here? And the tribal chieftain turns around and says, the reason why I'm here is because every seven to 10 years, I decide that we're going to move where the village is sighted. And the anthropologist and the archaeologist and the um, ethnographer have this little conversation. And they all say, why did they move from a locality that they had everything? They had honey in the trees. They had um, all the birds that they can eat. They had fish in the tributaries. Um, they had all the um, plant life. They had even planted crops. They had a stable community. And the chieftain would overhear this. And the chieftains in all five of those other villages that have moved would overhear this conversation. So the, the first chieftain would turn around to say to the anthropologist, the archaeologist, uh, and the ethnographer, have you heard about the story of Adam and Eve? And all three of them would say, of course we've heard about the story of Adam and Eve. We would think you wouldn't have heard about the story of Adam and Eve. <laughs> the tribal chieftain would say, well, I've certainly heard of that story. It's a Western story. Can you remember what happens in the Garden of Eden? There's a snake, a serpent, there's a man and a, wooden, a woman, and for a time, the Garden of Eden is perfect. And then they are so, succumb to the fruits of the tree. And then suddenly, the Garden of Eden is no longer a Garden of Eden. It becomes overgrown. Things go wrong. And in fact, the wonderful world of Adam and Eve collapses. 
And the, ethel- the ethnographer, the archaeologist, and the anthropologist turn around and say to each other, we don't understand. And the tribal chieftain turns around and say, I don't, I don't expect you would understand. But we have been here for thousands of years. And they would all go away. And I would say, we don't understand what the tribal leader was talking about. But we now know what the tribal leader was talking about. What he was talking about was that when you get to the point of civilization in a village where everything's perfect, you need to abandon that village and you need to move elsewhere. You've ever all heard of the saying, quit while you're ahead? <laughs> this is what the tribal chieftains, and every single one of those tribal chieftains would say the same. Every single one. We would move around our village, our community. And that's how we've done our, our civilization for generation after generation. In fact, that's how some of these people have continued their civilization for thousands of years across the Amazon basin. A sedentary, um, movable life, a portable life. However, that hides one important fact. Lots of the areas of the Amazon basin had civilizations which had communities and villages between five and 100,000 people living in localities. They were able to sustain themselves. But up until the past 20 years, we have not found the evidence. And this is the process that we always thought. This is, this is what we always thought. But because these tribal le- leaders and so on, it's been a long time and, and the oral history has mutated and changed. And because they've had contact with the Western world, things have inevit- inevitably changed. An archaeological understanding has been based upon what we see and not what is actually there. And what we're talking about what is actually there is if you go to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, what you will see is that before the Western world found Angkor Wat and discovered it was there, explorers could be passing the moats and walls of Angkor Wat and not even know that they existed. Catherwood and Stevens, when they originally found Palenque in Guatemala, they had to look twice before they could actually see the temples. In fact, Stevens and Catherwood in the 1830s simply passed city after city of the Maya, the Olmec, and the Aztec civilized, civilized worlds. These cities were completely lost and buried with the undergrowth of the landscape that we see in Central America. But exactly the same is to be said about civilizations in the Amazonia. Exactly the same thing. Enter a conversation with me, Henry. If I said to you that we are now starting to find civilizations that spread as far as the area of the Roman world, but up until now, we didn't know they existed. Can you imagine finding a, the Roman Empire and nobody knew it existed? Could you imagine that situation? I, yeah, I'd find it very difficult because of the amount of structures that actually exist. And, and are visible. I think that's it's a visibility. But I've also said about Angkor Wat being visible, except you would need to re- remove the mangroves and the trees. What they are actually starting to find is across the Amazon basin, they're finding roadways that are 50 meters wide. They are actually starting to find banks and ditches, ditches um, and ditches that are um, 10 meters across and uh, ditches that are three or four meters in depth, earthworks and banks. And they're starting to find all these things. And these, these are landscapes that they thought never existed. And there's a danger with this type of archaeology, a grave danger with this archaeology. As, as, as somebody who, who teaches these classes, and I think, I, I think sometimes as a conservationist, I, I, I say, well, we should leave the trees, the primeval landscape of the Amazon basin intact because it's never been touched by human beings. The reality is that most of it has. We go around the Amazon basin, we see crops that are still surviving in the middle of nowhere. Sweet potato planted hundreds of years ago in, in areas, and we think, well, why is this, this here? Strains of cocoa that have been planted, Bra- Brazil nuts 
that have been um, domesticated by Brazil. That's all these things have been planted. An entire world of civilization after civilization is now being discovered over the past 20 years. And maybe the analogy of finding the Roman Empire and its temples and its roads is maybe the incorrect analogy. But when you actually start thinking about maybe it's not. For example, for example, um, 30 years ago, um, actually over 30 years ago, I used to have a pen friend and she was called Fernanda. She lived in Brazil. She lived in Sao Paulo, a, a little part of Sao Paulo called Parisacaba. And we wrote to each other for a good 10 years. Um, and in about 1990, she sent me a very alarming letter. She said, I, I, um, did you know that Rio de Janeiro Harbour recently, Roman Amphora has been dredged up from the harbour of Rio de Janeiro. I've seen it, but the archaeologists are not allowed to report upon it. Because if they report upon it, they will lose their jobs. And I didn't think anything of this at the time. But then I started working out the maths. How did large cargoes of Roman amphora end up in Rio de Janeiro Harbour? Then we start to think that ships went off course and that was it. But if they didn't go off course, they were deliberately going to another civilization. They were deliberately going to... Um, towns, villages, and cities that were um, involved in this mass world trade in goods that involved the Romans and other worlds. Let's move on a little bit further. Let's try and make a little bit more sense of all this. To create, um, there, I've got a green tick there now. Um, to create, um, um, to create the full picture of where we need to go and to um, manufacture pottery, you need industry, you need trade, you need even access to um, technologies like the wheel. The, f the fact of the matter is, to have this type, type of technology, you can't be reliant upon those people that I started off talking about. The people, the ethnographer, the anthropologist, and the archaeologist would yeah, used to visit. We're talking about people that had another kind of civilization. So what we're going to do now, we're going to, we're going to move on to something, uh, we're going to move on to something completely different to try and paint this picture. And how I paint this picture is by showing you two little articles, the openings of two little articles. And here we go. There will be one coming up in a moment. And another little article will be coming up again. And I'm just getting these populated on the screen. And there we go. And we're going to start a new share. And here we go. Bingo. There's one point I made this afternoon was that um, this morning, actually, I said, um, everyone always, everyone gives me articles of the week and they tell me news, right? And the reason why I dismiss those bits of news, more or less, that you mentioned earlier on, which I didn't actually, um, I was aware of the one that um, the hum human genome is older than um, we ex uh, suspected and so on. But one of, one of the things is that we very rarely hear about Brazil. We very, very hear about new civilizations being found in Colombia or Ecuador. We very rarely hear about Peru or Chile. In fact, we hardly ever hear about any discovery being made in South America at all. But civilizations as big as the Etruscans are being found every few years. Landscapes with temples, um, roads, villages, towns, um, canals, everything are being found every few years across the Amazon basin. And we never hear anything about them. I can't remember the last piece of news that come out from this landscape, but you guys always provide me with news, but none of you are cutting any of it out. Maybe you're all biased. Maybe none of you care what's happening in South America, but the reality is, is that very little of it is actually getting into the media. 
I like to avoid politics, but I'm actively being involved um, politically myself um, with my life. But I like to keep her out of the archaeology, but on this one, we can't. Uh, this is one of the headlines. This is just from late last year. Archaeologists fear President Bolsonaro's agenda will kill Amazon civilization research. Actually, it's in the interests of the president to make people aware of the archaeology. In fact, by finding all these temples, and look at this, look at this um, cache of pottery. Look at this cache of pottery in Brazil. Now, this type of pottery is the type of stuff that you'd find associated with the, with the Incan world or the Mayan world, but it's in the heart of Brazil. What is it doing there? So in other words, that little story about the Roman amphora, that's nothing. What is more important are these cities and towns and townscapes and tasks the, these this 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 landscape um that that speaks and they've only allowed it to start to speak today over the past 20 years and the one thing that we're seeing is that with this mass discovery of this archaeology it's playing into the hands of the politicians because the politicians are now saying we've got every right to cut down the trees because 500 years ago there were no trees there anyway we've got every right to cut cut down the trees and burn down the trees because um, um a thousand years ago there was a 50 meter wide road here we've got every right to do it and the archaeology is be, being used as a dangerous weapon and to be honest with you president um Bolsonaro is actually got a good point. He's got a very good point. Um, what he's saying is that we can cut down the trees and they will rejuvenate like they've done before. But the way they were cutting down trees in the past was very different than the way they're cutting down trees today. Where these civilizations may be cutting down 100 acres a year in an area the Brazilian government is cutting thousands of acres down. That's the difference. But we did cut down trees in the past. And no, no politician or archaeologist can now tell the Brazilians that they're doing the wrong thing. Because they, they did it in the past. And if they can do it in the past, these trees will grow back. This is the danger of this type of archaeology. It's more explosive than the Anna Nurbe's work in connection with trying to prove the pure Aryan race before the Second World War. Another article on your screen, lost Amazon villages um, uncovered by archeologists. And this article itself, so this article dates back to uh, March, 2018. And I'm surprised that we haven't seen this before. Are there no Guardian readers out there? Um, lost Amazon villages uncovered, it not, is saying 81 there, but, but hundreds and hundreds. And I'm looking at this. And what we're seeing is what we're seeing without the trees and then using aerial photography is this very rich landscape. I've been to Roman sites with, with Bill and the rest of you. And I've said over there, there was a wall and over there, there was a bathhouse. And you're all looking at me thinking, I can't see anything. But I know there was something there because I've seen the aerial photography. I know there's something there because I've been involved in archaeology for a long time. I know that that site, site undulation represents um, a dovecot from the medieval period. All of these derive their origins with civilization. And this is the same type of civilization mm. that once existed across the Amazon basin. We got so much to look at today in regards to images and Bill needs to leave us at five o'clock. So let's crack on. And you know what? We're having wonderful weather here. It is tipping down, which is absolute great. It's wonderful. Do you know I haven't had to water the plants this morning? It's dry here. Yeah, well, you can keep the dry weather. I'm in, I'm in Wales and I expect it to rain. 
John, I even wrote a letter to um, Boris Johnson stating um, that we've got a right to have it to rain in Wales. Uh, we don't want to be you. We, we don't want to be you English, where you can have sun and beaches. We don't want any of that nonsense. I was saying to Boris, uh, this chart is this this map itself is um, a high resolution black and white image of Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Guyana, um, and so on and so on, and Chile and so on. Um, the so what you're looking at is that these little boxes are all those. These are the ones which were mentioned on that chart at the beginning with all that ceramic stuff. And you're going down the Amazon basin. Um, you're going down the Amazon river and you're going down these rivers and you're seeing um, city after village, after settlement, um, after civilization. All of these civilizations have, have something different about them. They had a different way of trading. They had a different way of surviving. And you know what? I, I'm, my thinking is not always like a Westerner, but when I started off doing this lecture on Monday, it was like a Westerner. I, I said, well, the reason why these, these settlements were abandoned in 1190 and 850 and, and 1440 was probably because there was some kind of disaster. They could have just moved down the road. They could have just decided that they're going to do things differently. And do you know where we saw that last week? We saw, we saw that with the Bedouins, Nabataeans Bedouins. Once they were the Nabataeans, wonderful city, and now they're the Bedouins again. They're living in tents. Still civilization. And do you know what? It was once thought by archaeologists that nobody could survive within this landscape. And now we're proving the archaeologists wrong. And sometimes I like saying I've been wrong about something. When we did the lecture on Darien, I clearly said to everybody that um, there was no way the Scottish could have ever built um, a world, a town or a fort, which had a longevity on the Darien Peninsula. It was inhospitable. But that's exactly what the archaeologists were saying about all these cities that they've been finding. There was no way anyone could have lived here but they did. And we've got truckloads of archaeology. There's so much archaeology that um, um, it's not even making its way into the news. It's a bit of an irony. Now, I've mentioned this before. It's known as Terra Preta. Now, this is, this is a very interesting um, little area um, of what we're going to look at today. Now, when we, um, when, we, um, when we think about those little villages that we described at the beginning, well, I couldn't get the ticks done. Um, when we looked at those little villages, the villages that were move, um, I would be describing um, a black earth layer and, uh, um, and then an area that would be... Um, um, undisturbed soil then you that might have an, another group of people moving out that locality undisturbed soil the original people moving back there and so on right so alternating layers of, of nutritious soil uh, with being the soil um, that's associated with the tropical rainforest um, but what they are finding is something they start different from even that description what they're finding at some of these sites such as Hatara, um, which is in the heart of the Amazon River, river um, off one of its tributaries. Um, that site itself has really thick black earth layers, very similar to those thick black earth layers that uh, me and Bill examined um, when we went to Orkney um, on that little minibus when we went to the um, Sunday. And, and what, what we saw um, was that there was these thick black earth layers and, they, and, and there was Mesolithic stuff there, Neolithic stuff there, Bronze Age stuff there, Iron Age stuff there, and later stuff there in big thick layers, big thick layers. That's terra preta, black earth layers. And this is found in locations across this Amazon landscape, Amazonian landscape. And 
is very different to something that I used to think many, many years ago. I remember doing, um, I remember doing um, the Amazon Basin um, 30 years ago when I was in school. I remember doing that. Um, and I used to think, I used to think that soil must be so rich. It must be like that because humans have never disturbed it. It must be like the one on the right. But you know what? I was completely wrong. Um, what happens is that this is the natural soil, undisturbed by man in some areas. There are little bits of pristine, but not a lot of it. Um, primeval. And what we're seeing is that because of the tree cover, um, and the earth and the way it breaks down there's a uh, there's a thin layer of uh, rich soil and the rest of it contains the root systems and these root systems absorb all the moisture all the energy from the earth to create those towering trees of 10 30 40 meters in height everything's raked out of the soil so it's it's a very barren soil and you can't really plant much into it that's pristine um um, tropical rainforest but this itself is a soil that's been added to and germinated and nitrates and phosphates added to it with the people who understood the landscape the same types of people that knew how to work alongside mother nature the same types of people who we've described their descendants at the beginning of this lecture but they've got a different way of doing things. We've got so much to learn from um, the way they manage their landscapes. And, and maybe the president of Brazil can be convinced to cut down trees in the correct way, using what our ancestors knew. And this is the direction. If they're going to cut down trees, they need to do it in an appropriate way. And then and only then can we see a balance within the landscape of the Amazon basin. And as you can see, I'm trying to do this in a completely unbiased way. Previously hidden ancient earthworks in the Amazon reveal challenging assumptions of pristine rainforest. Most of my notes tell me today that, that the archaeology spreads over most of the Amazon basin. I've even been trying to keep a lid on it. This is that terra preta, that thick black earth layer that's been added to over generation after generation. When I, when I, did, this in, um, when I did this in university um, many years ago, um, back in about 2001, 2002, um, we, we, we did all this, but I don't think we really understood what we were looking at because they hadn't actually started finding the cities um what what we had found is is layers of soil not layers of cities and stuff right but it's only now that we've been finding them because of the new technology and this is a difference that terra preta has uh you can see a younger version of bill on the left <laughs> and another version of bill on the right no, actually, that looks a bit like you with, with hair, Bill, and without glasses. You, you, you're dead spit. You think so? Yeah, well, I, I, right, do. Mate. I do. Yeah. Bill, can I, can I make a, an observation? And, and, and as the mics are off and nobody can hear this, you, you really had a tan chest that, um, last night, Bill. Had a what? You really had a tanned chest last night when you bared all. Well, I'd do it again if you want to. <laughs> and... Uh, well too much <laughs> pam was really upset with the fact that she didn't see the bottom half of my body last night in the lecture oh well whatever she wants they can't have it all they can't have it all yeah yeah so anyway this is getting back to a bridgend lecture isn't it flip and heck did i did i tell you of a letter i've actually got to write for the local newspaper uh, Michelle said to me you've got to write a letter to the local newspaper about women having the right to wander around uh, with their breasts showing. And I said, you yeah, what? And, and, and she said, yes, you've got to write a letter because um, women, when they wander around with their breasts showing, they're arrested and men can wander around with their breasts showing. 
And I looked over and she had her, her top off. The moral of the story is, don't fall for a trap like that. Right, anyway, um, looking back at this, um, looking back at this, um, these two images, um, you can clearly see the, the nature of um, Terra Preta and how that um, assists um, growth. And obviously, after a while, the Terra Preta is going to become exhausted. But whatever management systems they used, they kept adding to it. And whatever management systems that you've succeeded, because they were able to have cities and townscapes within areas um, for many, many generations. You, when you think about it, um, that there's one air, there's one place that they believe had a population of a hundred thousand people. How do you support a hundred thousand people in this type of landscape when we were even struggling in Europe? to even keep populations of tens of thousands of people in one area, let alone 100,000 people in a locality. But we'll go on to that in a short while. Uh, there's my namesake with shorter hair. And this archaeologist at Hathara, um, as, it, as he's excavating, uh, what you can see, intriguingly enough, is the pottery all the pottery in this dark earth layer and, and some bone as well. All this evidence. You, you remember, you, you've seen this, Bill. You've cre seen cross sections and you I know have. how rich these soils are. Mm. And, and, and they kept this landscape going. And there's no real understanding how they did it. Because I, this is one thing I've not mentioned this week, right? And, and I've just only realized it now, right? In every lecture I would give, in most books on archaeology, you will see archaeologists making the following point. If you stay at one location for long enough, you will exhaust the landscape. It's not happening here. And I can't answer that question. What we are, what we are doing is only beginning to understand these Amazon civilizations. Oh, give me a bloody chance. It's only been 20 years that lots of these have been uh, discovered. And uh, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say much about it. We all know these are Brazil nuts. Um, and for the record, the original name of these was actually nigger toes. <laughs> or nigger nuts. Um, and the name changed because they thought, the name was racist. Um, but this is a wonderful piece of evidence. What we do find is domesticated um, Brazil nut trees growing in areas where they shouldn't be growing. Obviously, they've been taken there by man. Now, now everybody worked this out. Go back to the Black Earth stuff, right? Now, Let's, let's, let's see something that I've not seen this week. And I've just realized this as I'm talking about it. These people taming the landscape would have had to have tamed the landscape like the one on the left agreed. And then eventually after time, they would have had to have produced soil like the one on the right. How they did that is a mystery but maybe the way they did it was to constantly rotate what they planted and what they use the landscape for and that would have only happened over hundreds if not thousands of years they understood their landscape meaning that the original trees that were within that landscape were long removed were long removed they're gone the original landscape is gone it would have had to be gone for them to create those black earth layers you cannot get black earth layers that rich without alternating things being there okay so let's look at this right um the ice age the time of the ice age Everything's removed from the landscape. 
but a rich layer of glacial deposits are left on the landscape. And as the landscape's left, animals wander across it. A tundra-like landscape. They leave their excrement, their urine, their urethra, their, um, they die on the landscape. Grasses grow, it rots down. And then, that's the second stage, the third stage is then trees grow. Trees grow across that landscape. Human beings come in, they cut down the trees. You get a charcoal layer. At some point, there may have been a burning layer. That's how these layers are created. But there's lots of interference for man to be able to do that. Now, some of the images that we're going to see um, are from, in, from the north uh, western side of Brazil at a place, at a province known as Acre. Right, so what I need to do, um, if, if we want to, um, if we get the cursor in, that's basically, um, that's basically where Acre is, okay? Um, and we will mention this place known as um, Zinu, okay? And we've got the pronunciation right on that as well. But let's go to this place along the Peruvian border and the Bolivian border. Um, so we know where that is. This is what they've been finding. Now, I've got to be very careful, Dell. These are classed as geoglyphs. These are described by one type of archaeologist uh, across that landscape and into Bolivia as geoglyphs. And these are believed to have been created by people that were building landscapes like those landscapes of the Nazca. And it's not a line of thought that I go along with. If you're going to build anything like these things, and there are thousands of them, you need houses, you need roads, you need transport, you need engineering. And it's highly insulting to say that they're just built for the sake of it. It's also highly insulting to say that they're built um, by aliens. This is a wonderful uh, piece of archaeology. And the reason why this is a wonderful piece of archaeology and I can see little Dell on the side there smiling. Um, because if you want to get an idea of scale, that is a cow. And that is a fence post. So these things are vast. Some of them are over a, a thousand feet across. And lots of them look like defended sites. Lots of them look like they could be corrals for cattle. But the, the, the reality is, folks, Whatever these things are, they cut down the trees. Like they're on age four. Bingo. Whatever they are, what you throw in anything, right? They're a model for a washing machine, right? Whatever these things are, they meant that the trees were cut down. It's something known as line of sight. And look at this as I draw on this, right? Let's create a perfect square. Obviously, this has been taken at a bit of an oblique angle. And if we go along there, the geometry on these is absolutely perfect. The only way you're going to be able to create that is if you cut down all the trees. There's no other engineering way of doing this. That is the point. That's the, I don't care what they are, right? The whole point of this is that they're being created by a civilized people. Tell me any different from these um, when you compare it with the Colosseum. It's, it's a sense of man's opulence. They're doing these things because they've got time and resources to do them. Those people that I described at the beginning are the descendants of the people that created these. And they don't need to do these anymore. It looks like a Roman fort. It looks like something defended, or it looks like something that we don't understand. But the reality is the trees were cut down to do this. And there are thousands of them. We're only starting to understand them now. The reason why they haven't been discovered up until now is because we haven't had LIDAR technology. 
and large tracts of the landscape hadn't been felled of their trees. And now we're finding them. We're finding many of these wonderful landscapes. Um, and there you go, a lone palm tree. And you know what the story about the palm tree? It's very different than you might think, but we'll come on to that um, soon. Let's move you back over there, Dell. We're back at the bottom of the screen. I don't know, I'm moving you around the screen. I don't know if you, you are you seeing yourself being moved around the screen? No, no I'm still on the bottom left, <laughs> where I seem to stay. A bit left wing, see. Well, well, I tell you what, with the likes of Glenda around, you couldn't be nothing but left than left wing. Do you know what I mean? Um, so again, look, looking at this, um, looking at this landscape, um, looking at Brazil, you've got one site there in Peru, one site there in Bolivia, uh, three in uh, across the landscape of Brazil. Now, this is this is rather interesting. None of these were known about twenty years ago. So let's just go, do a bit of a scratch and sniff, right? So in Peru, on the other side of the Andes, probably unknown by the Incan Empire when it started to grow uh, around um, 1,200 years AD, you've got a site known as San Martin. Um, and this site itself, they found um, growing there today, semi-domesticated fruit trees that would have been planted there. Agricultural earthworks for farming. There's farming there. Mounds with soil enriched with charcoal. Phosphorus and calcium that could have supported at least 5,000 people at that one site. Dating back to 900 years AD. Now, when we think about Fawcett and his adventures to find Petiti, um, and he disappeared. He said that he came back to the Institute in London and he said, look, I found pottery. I found evidence of another civilization beyond um, the Andes. And people just laughed at him. And it's, uh, it's taken over 100 years to pe for people to actually realize what Fawcett was saying was actually real. There, there are civilizations out there in the middle of nowhere. It's just being able to find them. What we then find is northern Bolivia. Found mounds of fertile soil, raised fields, long causeways and canalized rivers built around 1200 years AD. Villages with populations of up to 2,500 people uh, that ranged in date between 1200 and 1600 years AD. Now, that date, 1600 years AD, is interesting. But it's very likely that the Spanish never even got to that site. And it's also, also that, that we don't hear anything that the Spanish write about that site as well. The next one, this is actually pronounced um, Zinu. Um, it, was, it was great today. At the end of the lecture, the lecture went really well this morning. And Kathy piped up. She said, it's not... Shingi, which I thought it was, it's um, Zingi. And I went online and I heard a local person pronounce it as Zinu. X-I-N-G-U spells Zinu. Um, and at Zinu, which is where we're getting a lot of archaeology, they found networks of moats, roads, central plazas, ring villages, causeways and canals. They built canals. So we've got some parallels with the Roman world now at this stage. Marejo Island. Can you believe the following um, statement? Marejo Island, Brazil. Um, this would have been a major trade area. Discovered foundations of houses, elaborate pottery and evidence of advanced agriculture that could have supported over 100,000 people. It's, it's, it doesn't sound plausible, but this is what they're finding. Manaus. Um, this is where um, lots of people in the Navy would actually sail down the Amazon. Um, there's, a, there's a great port there mm -hmm. at the heart of the Amazon. And there we go. Found semi-domesticated fruit tree, orchards, 
and soil fertilized by a charcoal, human waste and other organic material, large plaza center and architecture and works, city abandoned um, in the year 1440, 52 years before the likes of um, Christopher Columbus. And it's at this point that I go somewhere else. Like Dell, I watch stuff on YouTube. But the type of stuff I watch on YouTube is very different from Dell's. Um, I watch these videos of people um, going into abandoned um, offices and abandoned manor houses and abandoned homes um, and so on. And I watch these videos and every time I'm shocked. Um, I've, lot, I've watched loads of localities they've been to. For example, I, I, I watched um, this, very relevant by the way this, because there's a big point to be made. I watched this one a few weeks ago. It was a, a group of people, they went to a place somewhere in mid Wales and they went into a farm and everything was left. Um, the farm had been deserted for 10 years. There was a, um, a television there. There was a piano. Um, there was stuff left on the table, cards of people still on the shelf. There was a mobile phone, glasses, everything, right? And then I thought that that was a one-off. And then I watched another one. Um, and it was, um, it was a business up in Birmingham that decided to relocate. Instead of taking their stuff from their old factory with them, they abandoned their, their laboratory and left everything there offices and they just moved to a new place they left everything behind new place and i thought that's really strange and then i watched another one of a mansion and the the guy says i can't tell you where this is and there's a land rover there's a bmw there's a there, there's a merc and they're all being overgrown by plants and they go into the house there's works of art on the wall um there's there's um um, um there's wonderful chinese pottery there's a TV, there's, there's a remote controls, there's everything still there, right? Completely abandoned. And I'm thinking, I don't understand this. I can't get it in my head how this happens. And I turn to Michelle and I says, can you explain what's going on here? And she says, well, I can understand the first one, but I can't understand the second one about the mansion house. People just abandon localities. And it's very likely that instead of these people being wiped out from disease, they just decided to lift themselves up and go somewhere else. They just decided to move. Why do we need diseases to wipe out these civilizations? Why do we need warfare to wipe out these people? Every time that um, somebody says that they found a Roman villa that's been abandoned, the Roman villa was set alight, by an unruly mob and everyone slaughtered and massacred, right? Which is absolute nonsense. We think we know what happened in the past, but I don't think we've got a clue. And this should be a start to try and understand civilizations because it's all new. We could start anew with assessing archeology, span start to put meat on the bones, this is Bolivia and space archaeology in the Amazon, um, Bolivia. And what they're finding at these locations, you can see the word geoglyph there. They're finding all these wonderful mounds and things that they don't understand. If you compare what they're finding in Bolivia, in these really thick um, jungle-like landscapes, if you compare this with the mound builders, of the Mississippi. You, we know that the mound builders of Mississippi, they, they, they had these huge mounds and on top they would have houses to keep the houses being um, uh, washed away by the rivers and all the rest of it. Um, and, um, and you think that's really sensible. And you go to Louisiana today and you see um, you, you see whole cities being flooded and you're thinking, well, if they learn from these mound builders, they might be able to build cities that don't get flooded because they did it in the past. But, the, but it was once thought that the mound builders of Mississippi um, 
they actually thought that they, they were great burial chambers and they actually thought that they were built by other people and so on. And they were actually built by their ancestors and they were built for some of the reasons that we've described. And this is, this is a new start in the archaeology, a new understanding in the archaeology, a new connection with the understanding. Now, this is rather interesting. Now, if I was on time team, um, I was shown, I, I was, you know, you're like in time team, right? Here we go. Um, is, uh, is it Stuart Ainsworth? He would come up to me with, with an aerial photograph or a geophysical chart and he would show, look at this, go and interpret it. And I would say, right. Now, what you can see is um, a wood henge, and what you can see over here is a Bronze Age barrow, and what you can see over here uh, is definitely um, a, a, a medieval field system, and what you can see here is some humps and bunks, humps and bumps of banks and so on, and that's the interpretation, right? But these ain't in Britain. These are in the Amazon Basin. Um, and... It, this is only being found today. Um, and the other thing to be said is that when we, when we think about what we're looking at, um, we've, got to be, we've got to step very carefully. Reading this here, ancient earthworks built in the Amazon have been revealed due to deforestation and modern technologies. The findings have been discovered in the Western Brazil Amazon by experts. The area had been covered by trees for centuries, but modern deforestation along with satellite images have revealed 450 of these large geometrical geoglyphs in the Acre State built about 2000 years ago. Their discovery is significant since it contradicts the theory that the rainforest ecosystem has never been touched by humans. Article after article are reading the same thing over and over again. The structures are ditched enclosures, measuring um, the, the, the ditches themselves are me me measuring 36 foot wide by 13 feet dip deep by over a thousand feet in diameter. These are huge, um, these are huge earthworks. Whether there's geoglyphs or hill forts or settlements or whatever they are, they're built in areas that saw the reliant clearance on large tracts of the landscape. With this little thing there, they see, they're seeing um, the analysis of charcoal, um, the analysis of charcoal, um, seeing ancient forest burning, um, vegetation coming back and forth. They're reconstructing past climates. This article uh, overrules the statement that they're used for habitation. They're saying that they're not used for habitation or defensive reasons. But then you go to somewhere like um, um, Manaus and the settlements there, and you can clearly see habitational layers. And you can see landscapes on the eastern side of Brazil that completely contradicts with that statement. But the other information at the bottom is very, very interesting. Researchers also conducted um, studies at um, two sites to define to what extent the region was forested when the geoglyphs were built, resulting in a reconstruction of um, a landscape that evolved between trees, agriculture, and so on. Vegetation and fire history, it's called. Their findings were stunning, as it turns out humans had altered the natural growth of bamboo forests for millennia and made clearings to build the geoglyphs. Bamboo forests? What happened to the palm trees? So you can immediately see that the landscape has been altered. The various tree species, such as palms, used for food and building, and avoided deforestation of larger areas with the use of fire. Researchers believe that today forests um, bear traces of these ancient agroforestry practices. What we are finding is an, um, a great diversity of landscape. 
And this image that we showed earlier on, forget the idea of these being geoglyphs. Let's just look at these again by what I've said. Um, various layers of archaeology. And how do I know these are various layers of archaeology? Let me give you a little lesson to understanding aerial photography. Now, let's do this. Now, the ones that you can see the ditches clearer are more recent. Then you look at things like this that are before the more recent uh, ditches. And then you look at these here that have, uh, that have been cut by this over here. Oh, hang on. Do you know what? It's not letting me do things today. Let's do a cross. There you go. That, that, that there, um, circle one, a cut into this earlier bank. And this here from phase two has also cut into this bank. So in other words, what we've got in, in, in order um, is, um, here we go. Um, that came first, that came second, and these came third. And that's how you can understand the area of photography. And then, if they're different shapes, um, if they're different shapes, then uh, if you're looking at British archaeology, for example, the linear line can either be from the Iron Age or the Roman period or from the Neolithic, and the circle comes probably from the Bronze Age. Those types of ideas. Um, and also, looking at um, area of photography, um, as this here, um, this itself cuts into this site, meaning that this site is more newer than this site. What we're seeing back in a Brazilian context uh, is this shows a, um, a landscape that's been used over a long period of time. Not a landscape that was used last week, that had never been used before, but a landscape that's been used over a long time constant changes within the landscape that we're seeing today. I think what we'll do, we'll take a break um, um, with this image. So um, what I'd like to know is, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I've got two, Carl. Please. Um, obviously, human remains offer so much archaeological evidence. Um, where, how many bodies have they found? Have they found any bodies anywhere? That's Why, one. Well, hang on, we'll answer that question. I was asked that very awkward question today and uh, this morning, right? And the answer is, we don't have much in the way of um, human remains. And do you want me to answer that decisively? When we looked at the Battle of Towton the other week, the Battle of Towton is the only archaeological site in Britain in regards to a battle that we have substantial human remains associated with the battle. We've got no human remains from the Battle of Hastings, the Battle of Watling Street, uh, the Battle of St. Fagans, the Battle of Bosworth, um, all these battle sites. Oh yeah, we, we've uh, Richard III, I forgot about that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, we don't have human remains, but the battle still took place, right? Um, the problem with human remains is that they're um, disposal. And human remains are not the same as looking at earthworks. Bill, we're just looking at what's on the surface with most of these sites at this minute. Human remains are going to be inevitably below the surface. So that's the answer to the question, but it's only half an answer. Next. Um, <clears throat> obviously, pottery have been found. Yeah. Um, Bucket loads. Is there, is there any evidence of writing or what these different civilizations call themselves? No. There's not. Okay, then. So at some point, we can have another um, example of Silurians and Minoans, fictitious names applied to these uh, groups. Do, it's going to come. It's going yeah, to yeah, come. It, it's going to come. And actually, it's already happening. There was um, I, some time ago, I think it was. Um, I do believe it was start of the outbreak. I think somebody came into the class and, and I, I obviously I was 
another planet back then. And I think uh, somebody turned around and said, oh, um, have you heard about this new civilization they found in Colombia? It's called so-and-so. It's already happened, Bill. Yeah, it, so. it, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's happening. Um, yeah. Right, um, what we're going to do is, um, anybody else got anything to say? Uh, uh, like uh, Henri? Just a quick observation. Um, Obviously, to get the impact on the soil that you talked about, really, are we winding the clock back to an extensive prehistoric farming environment? Yes. Um, the only way you, it, but it's not, it's not the same environment that we're talking about. Okay, so say I said to you, right, um, the year is 1,645 BC, um, Thera has erupted, from that moment onwards, most of the upland areas of Wales, um, Cumbria, Scotland and um, Cornwall have become abandoned, right? Because they exhausted the land, all the rich soils went into the valleys, the upland areas were abandoned, right? But there's, in the Amazon, right, it's, it's alternating um, the landscape. So basically one minute you're yeah, growing rotation. trees. Yeah, but this is different rotation. This is, this is not agriculture. This is this is husbandry on a different scale. This is one minute you've got the natural trees, the ground is really poor. You introduce another crop in there. The land is still poor, but then you introduce something else. And then you do, um, then you have pastoral um, farming and then you do this and that. And eventually the soil builds up. So this is happening over a long period of time, but this is not the same assessment of medieval um, or Roman landscapes. This is very different. And we don't really understand it yet. Yeah, so that, that yeah. hopefully that answers it. Yeah, um, that's okay. Pat? Oh, I'm fine. Lovely. And Delwyn? Okay, we'll take a break. Okay. okay. I better not fall asleep this time. <laughs> I honestly have fell asleep. I couldn't believe it. I, and, and the problem is, because I'm so used to my phone and the noises on it, it don't wake me up anymore. <laughs> I can believe it. <laughs> no, I, I just, I'm just going, we'll, we'll... Oh, can I check, Carl? Did you get my uh, email with the contact information? Oh, I've lost you. Your details have been entered into the diary and your, uh, that, that's been archived into the... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I'll let you go. Okay, sorted.
finger. So we've got some, what images are we showing in front of us now? Earthworks, right. uh, inverted commas, glyphs. Exactly. Unfortunately, glyphs is actually the word used for stone geoglyphs. Or, mind you, I could be corrected in, in saying that that could refer to earthworks. But anyway, um, I'd like to start off with trying to get back into it. So um, what, we're, what we're looking at again in this wonderful is the sense of the line and the symmetry. And these people knew exactly what they were doing, whatever this is for. Um, and what I've got now, um, after a couple of images, I've, I've got another article I'd like to read through. But something like this, if you come across something like this in Britain, you would, um, you would be excused for thinking that this was, um, this was a ceremonial landscape, or you'd be excused for thinking that this is a domestic landscape. In fact, um, what you can see quite clearly here are these very, very deep ditches. Um, and clearly you can see um, a road that leads into somewhat of a plaza. Um, but I should really stick to saying that um, these are constructed by the ancestors of those on the landscape. But when you see the similarities of some of these sites and ours in Great Britain, this is very intriguing. Now, um, I don't know if you've been with me, Bill, to a site at, um, known as Fleming's Down near Ogmore. No? I might have, Carl. I can't remember. But basically, on. it was this weird hill fort, which is um, in a weird locality that's basically shaped like this. Now, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this looks very Iron Age. This, this looks very, you know, this would, what I'm trying to get at, this would be very much at home with the stuff that we saw la in last night's lecture, isn't it, Bill? That it uh, the, these banks and ditches, and what is the use for this? But again, why am I obsessed with the use and just going along and saying that these have been created Trees have been felled, and these are wonderful monuments, and these are a sign of civilization. Um, and just, just one little thing that's deviating a little bit. I love the fact that you've got the flat land here, and the ditches are almost cut into the slope, which is, which is a really sharp slope. I, I, I like that little feature. Um, I just want to chuck that in there as a little bit of a foible more than anything. And again we've seen this one and now you know when archaeologists are referring to some of these as geoglyphs now this is um immediately when i saw this i thought this looks very similar um to a football pitch in a way <laughs> football pitch is put a weird angle but again i'm drawing the lines on there and if we go there look at that there and if we the geometry are with this as well and if this was if this wasn't an oblique view, this would be perfect. And the same thing can actually be said about this as well, uh, the geometry of this. And again, the clearance of the landscape, um, and again, putting this into um, the sense of what happened in the past that we don't clearly understand. We don't really know what's going on, and none of the descriptions are telling us this. This looks more like a settlement site, uh, more or less a, um, a and. One thing that's coming up in the images, which um, I don't think if anyone spotted this, is that the sites that we've been looking at indicate archaeological sites that were within a landscape um, that the trees were felled a decade ago. Um, it, you know, this, this looks like um, if somebody started planting trees across this landscape now, um, it, it wouldn't be um, any time soon. But... Um, there's this landscape has been used for the trees um, and for the ranching and in 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 my thinking it's about time that this would was reforested um, and this is another point when we when we looked at the beginning of the lecture we looked about the controversy of the archaeology now if the 
um, president of um, Amazonia is keen um, on embracing um, cutting down the trees but replanting, why isn't this being done here? I just wanted to ch chuck that little point in there subtly, ex except it's very political. Um, and very much a landscape that sees um, settlements, um, very much a landscape that sees a, a variety of different uses. Um, and another one of these square boxes, again, hundreds and hundreds of these things. And before we go on to this little one here, and before we go on to Hatara, I would like to read out another article. Uh, th this, this, is, this is amazing, this. Um, but let's um, change the screen. Uh, if you bear with me a minute. It's showing on the screen, so that's going to be very useful for me. I'm just double checking something else. Good, good. Right, okay, start screen sharing on a new screen. Finger. Now, whenever I do, whenever I do my research, I always like to find things that disagree with me so I can argue with myself and then I can argue with you guys. But I, it's very difficult to find any alternate view to what we're seeing. Every, every story, story after story, um, is telling me that um, these things are new um, and that we've seen extensive clearance of um, the Amazon landscape in the past. Headline news there, archaeologists discover a grid of villages and managed parks. This article, this actually dates back to 2003, but I, I, back then I, I wouldn't have dreamt of anything like this. The guy writing this work is a guy by the name of uh, Dr. Heckelberger and Jim Raleigh uh, in science. Newly discovered traces of ancient roads, bridges and plazas in Brazil's tropical forest may help, may help dispel the once popular impression of an untouched Amazon before the Europeans' arrival. In southern Brazil, archaeologists have found the remains of a network of urban communities that apparently hosted a population many thousands strong. Now, this is within that southern landscape of the Amazon. Um, and this is in that landscape um, associated with the Zinu people. There we go, in the upper Zinu region of southern Amazon. Now, the archaeologist doing the research there, Michael Heckelberger, um, has been researching this, finding networks of large villages set out in grid-like patterns. Setting villages out in grid-like patterns or towns is not something that is done by any old Tom, Dick and Harry. The residents, ancestors of the modern day um, Zin Ganos um, dug enormous ditches around the villages, built bridges and moats um, in wetland areas and cultivated large tracts of land. And before anyone um, points out Zing Guanos or Guanos or Guano, um, somebody said in a lecture at the beginning of the week, they said, oh, are these the people of the dung or the people of the shit? Because that's what Guano means. Um, I, but I think that's really disrespectful. But um, these people um, see this landscape in their past and they they're still using one or two of those bridges and moats that their ancestors had created so they've got a direct link so this is why the archaeologist Heckelberger thought this was a good start we're going to start here to understand the landscape this here it seems that virtually no part of this landscape was truly wild or pristine even some of the forested areas may have been more akin to a large park than to untouched forest this point I made earlier on about Darien, too hostile for habitation. Though multitudes of plants and animals thrive in the Amazon, the environment was, too, was long, long thought to be too hostile for large scale human settlement. In particular, archeologists believed that the soil quality was too poor to support the intensive agriculture that would be necessary to support a population of significant size. Um, and, that has been turned on its head. 
The general impression of native Amazonians as stone age primitives frozen uh, um, at the dawn of time um, hasn't changed up until 20 years ago, but now it has. There was a cherished image of the Amazon being pure, hadn't been touched since, um, hadn't been touched before 1492. But this key question has been challenged. Um, and, you know, somewhat provoking bitter debate as, as I've tried to create today in my own mind over how extensive the land could have been settled by humans. A key reason for the controversy was up until two decades ago, there was no physical evidence of these settlements, but now it's coming through in the droves. Even the likes of the Zingguano people um, with their written records only going far as um, 1884, um, even they didn't really know their past. Even though there's these bri bridges and banks and ditches, they really didn't know their past. Uh, the Europeans first encountered these people in, in the 1750s, and lots of them would be enslaved. It was in the 1950s that the Zinguano people um, were being approached by those archaeologists and those ethnographers and the anthropologists to understand what was going on, and, and very few of them would come to anything other than the lives that they were living today and the torturous problems that they went through since the 1750s. The indigenous Amazonian numbers um, were decimated because of contact with the Western world. And losing that link with the past was another result. This little um, satellite image on the right is rather interesting because it, it shows um, marked onto the satellite imagery, uh, large trackways and these villages, which would be linked by large, um, when I say trackways, roadways, which is more like it. Within this landscape, this is small area. There are 19 settlements linked by these roads and plazas. Part of the um, Zingano people um, are a sub-tribe known as the uh, Kurukuru. Um, and the Kurukuru, um, the Kurukuru, um, um, in collaboration, it's the belief that the engineered features of the landscape all involved elements of the Kuruku's understanding of the entire cosmos. Um, but when we come into something like that, when people are saying it's about the cosmos, you always think it's about aliens, or you always think it's about alignment of the three pyramids um, at, at, at Giza with, with the constellation and, and all these different things. But we th when we think about um, the cosmos and when we think about um, um, our land and when we think about the villages back in their landscape, the cosmos would have had a different meaning. And I think we need to respect that. It's not just about stars and suns and gods. It's about something else. Listen to this here, this, this next um, paragraph. Roads in the ancient settlements were up to 50 meters wide. Now, 50 meters wide is, is bloody wide. And go on, Dell. They were 50 meters wide because um, alien ships would land on them. Well, of course, and Glenda would agree with me. Or agree with me. Uh, anyway, so when you think about these 50 wide, wide roadways, um, it's, it's important to think that we've no idea why they're 50 metres wide. Uh, but these 50 metre wide roadways were, f were, were flanked with large curbs as well. Um, so stone brought in to actually curb the roadways. So these were proper defined roadways. These, ju these just weren't trackways, they were properly defined. These, these were wider than anything that the Incas built. These were wider than anything that I know um, throughout most of the Roman Empire because there are fairly wide roads in the Roman Empire. The researchers report that the roads link settlements every two to three miles along an extensive grid. This kind of planning would have required relative, relatively sophisticated ability to re reproduce angles over large distances. Again, the line of sight. We've got the ancient bridges and moats that the, uh, the Kurukuru, uh, the um, um, are using today and the canals, but this was a very extensive 
very well managed world. And these are very different from those other peoples that we've been looking at today. The entire area is between um, settlements was carefully engineered and managed according to the researchers. It was likely either cultivated or maintained as a sort of parkland, a managed area rather than wild or pristine forest. This is what the satellite image is telling us, that these areas of human landscapes um, look quite different from areas of older forests. Now this is, this is very much key to what we've done today. We've got another little article, some more images, um, and then we'll call it a day. Two little articles, actually. Uh, this is, if I read this all out, I'm not going to divert from it. Conservation questions. The upper um, um, Zinu um, is the largest um, contiguous or continuous tract of Amazonian forest still under indigenous management. And somebody's flashing a message up. They get very annoying when that happens. Roman impact or help? Oh, keep that one, Henry. Start again. The, the Zinu. Its history brings up the question of how to go about conser conserving the remaining Amazon. Should the goal be to preserve a pristine wilderness untouched by human activity or a working landscape that supports indigenous people? Perhaps both um, options need to be mutually exclusive. Dr. Heckelberger is quick to point out that the Amazon is not a uniform landscape. Because it's so poorly known, Western knowledge has tended to treat the area as one homogenous thing, one big jungle, one big rainforest, one natural lab for primitive people. Dr. Heckelberger said, as we dig into the region, we realize that 500 years ago, it was very different and that even today there is a large amount of variation that we didn't appreciate before. These people weren't involved in the same kinds of cultural human um, innovation as elsewhere in the world. I think that's a very insulting statement, actually. Uh, we're not talking about the Inca or Roman Empire here, aren't we? Uh, but in terms of the rest of the world, Asia, um, Africa, Europe, the Americas and elsewhere, Amazonia, Amazonians were no less capable of human cultural innovation than anyone else. Um, and I think that's, um, the point that um, Henry made a few moments ago was that, um, you know, was there, any, was there any impact made on this landscape by Roman civilization? Was, was there some Roman assistance? Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, the fact of the matter is I'm going to say no. I'm also going to say that um, when we think about um, determinism, people are eventually going to create straight roads, whether you like it or not. People are going to create gridded-like landscapes if they're going to be similar to another civilization or not. But links and influence from other civilizations can't be um, discounted. Um, so we'll move on from that very question. And another little article here, um, I just want to um, plod through this one. Um, you know, it's, it's talking about um, the challenging uh, pristine and unspoiled environment syndrome, um, the 2.6 million square miles um, across um, nine countries. Um, the Amazonia holds an extraordinary array of life, harboring uh, ten, uh, one out of 10 of all known species of animals on the planet and one in five of, of all um, Earth's known birds. Although the Amazon is often thought of pristine, over um, recent decades, we, we know that that landscape is rather different. Um, one thing that they're doing is, is that chart, that, we, that little image that we've just seen before we go on to this, which we're going to go on to. Um, what they're finding is that um, by examining the soil landscapes and plants, um, and even the, the, the textures of existing languages, they're able to understand the extent of those civilizations that spread across this landscape. It is a consensus that central and southern Amazonia were well populated, now anyway, with abundant domesticated plants, um, forests, landscape or soils. Um, you know, one thing I've asked all week is that, um, 
I've asked in 1980, what types of things would you be finding in a fruit and veg shop? How many varieties of fruit and veg would you find? And the answer is usually about 10. Well, these Amazonian peoples, we know of at least 83 domesticated types of fruit um, and veg um, they had access to, 83 different types of species. And you're thinking about medieval um, England being quite a, um, um, a boring um, diet. And these people, okay, had 90 different types of domesticated species of fruit and veg. Uh, and there are obviously some in, in that that we haven't discovered yet. We know they had sweet potato, cocoa, um, um, tobacco, pineapple, cassava, love it, hot peppers, numerous fruit trees and palms. So the, these, these are all being planted and being domesticated. And look at that, nearly up to 5,000 um, non-domesticated species we've been seeing in the archaeological record that they would have used on a day-to-day -day basis for their other reasons. So they had a massive um, larder of food to rely upon. Although many present-day Amazonian forests may seem natural, research suggests they are domesticated to varying degrees, possessing different populations of plants than one would expect in a naturally biological diverse forest. Um, we've mentioned this quite extensively about the Amazonian dark earths, um, and they, they believe that um, the areas that they, that they were focusing on for their settlements, 0.1% of the Amazon is going to be consisting that. That might not sound a lot, um, but at some, a figure, listen to this, right? Um, there was a quiz question, and it said something like, how much of Britain is built on? Um, is it 50%? Is it 25%, 10% or 1%? And most people went for 25 or 50%. The answer is 1%. So um, if you think about it, if population centers covered 0.1% in the Amazonian landscape, that's quite a considerable area. Um, and we would say that we're on a, um, a tight knit, knit island with uh, very little land to spare. When in fact, most of it isn't built on, 99%. Um, so populations rapidly increasing, populations of up to 10 million people. Whenever we think about South America and Central America, we think about the likes of the Inca, Maya and the Aztec. But we now know about these people. Um, they didn't have as much access to stone, but they had access to building a civilization. Um, and their worlds were not necessarily wiped out due to various diseases. Um, this last statement by the author, um, Mr. Clement, although Amazonia, Amazonia reverted to wilderness after the decimation of its native peoples, or they moved on or something else for whatever reasons, uh, the author of the work stressed that it doesn't mean the Amazon rainforest will return wherever modern society allows it to. So in other words, what we're saying is if you cut down trees, um, thousands of acres, are you able to... Um, make it revert back to natural wilderness. When their cutting down trees was very different um, from our cutting down trees today. This is a fallacy um, because native Amazonians did not clear cut the forest, nor plant pastures and soy. We are not saying that modern society can clear cut the forest for food production. Um, what, what we need to look at is the native Amazonians could support complex societies without destroying the environment. We today might learn something from native Amazonians. And I think that is a, a message. Um, they, they, cut an, they cut down an acre of trees, they leave an acre of trees. They cut down an acre of trees, they leave an acre of trees. That's the way to go. That might replicate part of previous... Um, um, societies and civilizations that once um, operated in um, the likes of South America. Um, looking very much close to the end now, uh, this um, a note to say that when the archaeologists are looking at across this landscape, you can see all these little black dots. These represent um, Brazil nuts, and the Brazil the cultivated Brazil nuts can be found over a large area human uh, interference. Um, if you look into areas, they, they've been finding um, examples of sweet potato growing in the middle of nowhere. 
um, um, marupi peppers growing in the middle of nowhere, pineapples, um, um, the likes of cocoa, the likes of cocoa tobacco all over the place. Um, and what they're seeing is that there's a great crop diversity over large tracts of this landscape. There's Manaus, where we're going to go now, in the center of the plan there, um, to a site known as Hatar Amhara. Uh, this raised area, looking uh, over a um, tributary of the Amazon River near Manaus. Um, and there's Manaus there, and there's our site. Now, they're coming across lots of these sites and actually studied them, not destroyed by modern um, um, interference. And just read this out as well. Some of you may have heard this, that with the um, site that we're talking about, um, they found that this site, the people at the Hatahara site were very much reliant upon um, the flora and fauna associated with the river. Um, and their world flourished between 750 to the year 1230 years AD. It flourished. They were very much reliant upon food. And then suddenly, these people disappeared. Um, we've already mentioned an explanation for the, the movement of these people or disappearance. Um, but it's probably very different from the, the standard understanding of how people move around and disappear. And looking again, if we um, go back to this, um, and so lots of research, lots of research are being done at sites. Um, Manaus itself um, is a big city. Um, it's a big trading city with a, with a harbour. And um, obviously doing archaeological work near the centres of education. But obviously they're finding archaeological evidence all over. And pottery as well. Pottery relies upon potters, um, skilled, trade, uh, movement, clay. Um, and this is the type, level of archaeology they've been excavating. And look at this as well. Through the terra um, uh, preta, um, you have all this pottery. And then above, you've got another layer of occupation, another layer of occupation, different phases, different changes. And again, the terra preta, lots of this. Um, uh, uh, evidence have come from the um, Hatahara site and a bit of evidence for their being there a harpoon for their fish what I've tried to do today is just do a, a tiny little bit of an overview of these Amazon peoples whether I've done them enough justice I hope I have but there's this has been not even a smidgen of what we know about these Amazonian peoples. And Bill's right. Are we going to hear um, about the tribal people of uh, Manaus? Are we going to hear about um, the Colombian uh, people of, of Belbot? Or are we going um, we, to make up names for these people? Uh, which is going to be a bit of a shame, really. Um, and it's going to be a bit of a shame because they don't really connect us um, with this very rich landscape. And it is a very rich landscape that we can only learn to understand. Maybe the archaeology um, can assist, um, can assist in changing the Brazilian government's mind in how to deal with this landscape. So the, what we're going to do, we need to learn from the past on this one. Are there any questions? Many of the sites um, identified so far, Carl, uh, particularly in forest regions, were um, discovered using LIDO. Yes. So if, that, if that's the case, there must be years and years' work left to cover such a huge area to discover exactly how many more civilizations are out there and un undiscovered, yet to be found. That, so that, that, yes. So much more, isn't it? It's, it's a yes. huge, huge area, isn't it? It's, uh, it's a whole new, whole new branch of archaeology, isn't it? And uh, history really is fascinating. It is completely. And, and do, you know, do you know what, Bill? Uh, we, we've got so many regrets in our life. And uh, this friend of mine in Brazil, I, I wish I hadn't lost touch uh, because um, I could have just phoned her now and I could have said, you know, but no, that, that's by the by. Um, yeah. 
and it would have been great to have that contact. So, um, a anyone else? Anyone else got anything else to say? Oh, really interesting. Uh, it got so many thoughts rattling around. Yes, yes. So, so, so many thoughts. Um, so, so, so many deep thoughts rattling around. I agree. Um, and Pat, let's have your let's have your do dare on. We can see the damnable United States flag in the background. Why haven't you got one of the old Confederacy? If you had a, a flag of the old Confederacy, you'd be classed as a racist. Uh, the, the Rotary Club. I gave it to my husband when he was there in America. <laughs> oh, cool, 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 cool. Anyhow, no, it was very interesting, very interesting. I have been to the Amazon basin, but it was way over in Ecuador. They took us on a down to a river and on a little boat and to a resort way up above the river that was a tributary of the Amazon. So it was quite, and though, oh, then they took us to a little island where they had a blow thing, you know, a long pipe and they could blow a dart, you know, to kill a, well, they had a wooden bird up there and they, they, <laughs> <laughs> they swung around, you know. Oh, they had jewelry they made too, you know. It was very hot, very sticky. Oh, terrible humidity. Yes. Well, in, in that situation, Bill would have taken his top off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you my, my muscles one day, what's left of them. <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly, exactly. Um, well, next, next week, um, um, next week we've got the uh, the archaeology of Great Zimbabwe and Mapumbwe. Don't forget Sunday as well. Um, the uh, what's happening? We are one o'clock. Lantwick Major Train Station. Any books? It's the Archaeology Cymru Library. Uh, some of the books are new and they've been paid for by a grant. You're welcome to read them and um, use it as a library. That's what it's for. It's free. So great. Um, do, you, do you know what? Since this lockdown. Um, um, everything's changed and in, in in a way everything's working and um who would have thought uh, that we'd be paying for somebody to go to you guys to take you a library that you can take out books for free amazing <laughs> great okay i've got to go now thank you all right, all right then if nobody's got anything else to say i'm going to say goodbye yeah. bill del bye, henry bill. Bye, 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 everyone. I'll see you guys on saturday wednesday or the forum next week don't forget okay Bye. 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 Bye.